welcome students now we are entering into a very interesting zone of urology this is considered to be a very very important session from general surgical as well as urological aspect and specially pertinent to the examination both the descriptive type as well as the mcq type we'll see slowly uh, various important topics related to this vast area of urology we'll start with the basic anatomy renal anatomy is again very interesting uh, we have to understand both the embryology how it is getting evolved as well as the basic structural anatomy kidney is a dynamic structure uh, as a breast so anatomically and physiologically it is a very very important uh, structural unit in the body it is the main excretory organ of the body which actually converts blood into urine so we'll start with the basic embryology now as you are aware there are various diagrams actually i have drawn to understand uh, to you the basic concepts about the anatomy the first diagram shows about the entire unit of kidney it is usually consisting of two components one is the renal parenchyma and second is the collecting system the renal parenchyma is further divided into uh, cortex and medulla and there is a basic structural unit of renal papilla collecting system is divided into again two types the renal pelvis and actually the cholesis this cholesis uh, these are placed in the combination of 3 plus 2 plus 2 embryologically in a child when in the womb or fetal life there are many calices more than 12 to 15 and there are many lobulations that are present in the kidney but as the child grows and after the child birth the other calices are getting absorbed and they are now remain into this particular combination of 3 plus 2 plus 2 so these calices they unite in the center and form what we call as the main collecting system which then formulate the renal pelvis which at angulation forms the pelvic ureteric junction which then proceeds as a ureter ends into the urinary bladder inside transmurally this is urinary bladder and continues as a urethra now male and female urethra will be different second thing is about the axis and the position of the kidney which you will see first quickly i will touch the important aspects of the embryology now the renal pelvis and the collecting system what we have seen arises from the wolfian duct lower end of the mesonephric duct other name is given is a wolfian duct usually 6 to 8 months of embryonic life renal parenchyma is getting originated from the metanephros there are three things one is the mesonephros one is the metanephros and one is the epinephros so the parenchyma is getting originated from the metanephros between 5 to 8 weeks of a fetal life as i've already mentioned the fetal lobulations are eventually getting absorbed and it gets converted into a smooth renal parenchyma and smooth contour as the baby evolves however these lobulations are retained in certain species such as auxins and bears collateral configuration we have already seen now we'll talk about the axis and the uh, position as you know uh, renal name is arrived from the greek word means bean shaped so this is a typical bean shaped a schematic diagram i have shown to you this is a midline posterior midline this is the 12th rib which is seen and the kidney is not straight but at an angle or axis angle okay this is a narrow angle of approximately 20 to 25 degrees this sometimes rotates depending on various congenital anomalies or various congenital positions this kidney is invested into various facial coverings the commonest covering that is getting covered is considered or called as gyrotas fascia now it has again the anterior and posterior fold anterior fold of zucker candle and posterior fascia of told so this gyrotas fascia engulfs and protects the kidney as well as the spread of the tumor 
the location of the kidney is from T12 to L2 to L3 vertebra. That is, it starts from the upper level of T12 vertebra and continues till the body of L2 or upper level of L3 vertebra. So a span of approximately three and a half vertebrae size body. The length of the kidney uh, it varies. It is usually nine centimeters. The breadth is seven centimeters, and the thickness is up to three centimeters. It weighs one hundred and fifty grams uh, for adult male and one hundred and thirty-five grams for adult female. Now, this basic anatomy is very uh, important for you to understand because various aberrations, various surgeries, various anomalies are directly related to this. Next, we'll consider about the polar anatomy of the kidney. Now, this is very important from vascular point of view because the blood supply of the kidney comes from either side. Now, this are the these are the imaginary lines, the upper line, posterior line, and the quadrants. Apical zone, upper anterior zone, middle anterior, and lower anterior. And this is a watershed area. It is called as a broadal line. This is relatively a vascular zone, which is of surgical importance when planning incisions on kidney. This is a posterior part, which is seen on. This is a lateral profile view. This, in brief, I have uh, mentioned to you various anatomical aspects of the kidney. Now we'll proceed to various other uh, structures and various other entities related to the kidney. We'll first begin with the basic things that is the various congenital anomalies that we encounter for kidney. Now what are these? There are various things that are occurring during the childbirth, various changes, configurations and aberrations. Commonest what we see is renal ectopia. But to begin with, we have to mention about the absence of kidney or renal aplasia. That is totally absence of one kidney or both kidneys. Both kidneys is not compatible with life. So please understand, renal aplasia when we mention is usually solitary absent kidney. Renal ectopia means the position of the kidney is at certain different position than the normal. Now, as you are aware, as the child grows from fetal life to newborn life, a uh, kidney usually ascends okay so initially the kidney is residing in the pelvis it slowly ascends to the posterior abdominal wall so sometimes this ascent is arrested at particular level which gives rise to various ectopic positions for the kidney so one can have a pelvic kidney that is the kidney limited to the pelvic cavity second is a horseshoe type kidney when the kidney is fused ectopically at different level anteriorly or posteriorly and sometimes a very rare is a crossed renal ectopia so the kidney has migrated to the opposite side there is a crossover then is the cystic disease another congenital anomaly in this anomaly what we see two main forms what are important to us one is a polycystic variant that is a polycystic kidney disease and second is a solitary cyst present in the kidney. We will see polycystic kidney eventually in the next slides. Fourth anomaly what we commonly encounter is aberrant renal vessel. Now this aberrant renal vessel or aberration of the normal insertion of the renal arteriorenal vein is very important. Why? As you are aware, in this kidney usually the arrangement is uh, renal pelvis, vein and artery. So if the artery or the vein is engulfing the ureter or the pelvic ureteric junction or getting inserted high or low or from front or from different angle, then it is actually going to compress this collecting system. And that is what is concerning us or that is what is actually bothering us because this compression or some pressure is going to leave as to what we know as a pelvic ureteric junction obstruction or PUJ obstruction which is not good which is painful and which will lead to swelling of the kidney or hydronephrosis so this aberrant renal vessel is one entity one should be well versed with then one more congenital anomaly is the duplication of the kidney 
Now this kidney, as you know, is getting evolved at various levels from various tissues. A person can have a double kidney, that is one kidney on one side and double kidney on the opposite side. One can have just duplication of the renal pelvis. So there can be one pelvis and say two pelvis at the location. There can be double ureter formation, single renal pelvis but two ureters. Then there can be mixed variant of all this. So one should be well aware that these aberrations can actually occur even a normal healthy person. Other rarer congenital anomalies are retrocaval ureter that is presence of ureter behind the IVC that is behind the inferior vena cava we call it retrocaval and a mega ureter. Mega ureter is nothing but a dilated ureter with a diameter of at least 2 cm or more. So it is considered pathological. Why? It, it reflects the distal obstruction and because of which there is a dilatation of this ureter. Now we will touch two important aspects of this congenital anomalies. One is a horseshoe shaped kidney and second is a polycystic kidney disease. Horseshoe kidney. The incidence is 1 is to 10,000. Sometimes it can be unilateral or bilateral. It fuses anteriorly. That is what is peculiar or unique to this particular condition. If we see uh, from the posterior anterior view or on sonography, it will show a big chunk of tissue or big piece of tissue which is present anteriorly over the vertebral column and going around the kidney. Now this peculiar pattern of horseshoe arrangement changes many aspects of the kidney position, kidney, uh, the ureter uh, that is going uh, from the penal pelvis to the bladder and that would causes obstruction that is the pelvic ureteric junction obstruction. Ureters will form a different curve or different path. Now this is a normal path of the kidney and this kidney getting rotated will have some different path and will have a haze like appearance which is very peculiar to horseshoe kidney. Now what happens because of this fusion what goes wrong there is stasis of urine. Now this urine stasis uh, is not considered good because anything that stagnates will lead to infection and subsequently it will form a nidus or subsequent stone formation and these stones are uh, notorious for eventually giving rise to pelvic ureteric junction obstruction that is why we are to be very careful in these patients uh, with POG obstruction many of the times no treatment is required because this condition goes almost lifelong or symptomatic there won't be any pain unless there is obstruction uh, because the kidney has lot of compensatory capacity if one kidney goes other kidney can compensate or overwork so patient may not be symptomatic so it can be just accidental finding by doing USG for the patient but yes if the patient is symptomatic patient is having pain or patient is having POG obstruction then these patients will require a surgical intervention in which we have to divide the fused midline portion and separate out or release the obstruction. Next we will move on to another important aspect that is a polycystic kidney. Now this polycystic kidney is seen in two components or two variants rather. One is the adult variant and one is the infantile variant. Now adult variant is transmitted as autosomal dominant trait while the infantile variant is transmitted as autosomal recessive trait. The adult variant is usually seen very rarely before the age of 30 years and 18% of these patients will have liver disease which is cystic in nature. Now what will be the clinical features of these patients? These patients will have a irregular upper abdominal mass. Sometimes this is the only common uh, complaint with which patient will come to you. Sometimes they do have loin pain sometimes hematuria and rarely infection but common things are irregular upper abdominal mass loin pain and hematuria then yes few patients do present to us with hypertension and few patients present to us with uremia 
investigations for this polycystic kidney what we need to do is aspirate the fluid for cytological purpose for various debris and blood it will confirm our diagnosis then a good ultrasound of the abdomen and pelvis will confirm the diagnosis which will show multiple cysts in both the kidneys intravenous urography is considered gold standard and it will show to us typical spider leg appearance because the calyces are very thinned out so it gives a picture like a spider or sometimes uh, the calyces which are dilated will give like a bell like appearance treatment of polycystic kidney usually this patient will have some sort of renal compromise or failure they may come in chronic failure so we have to treat the renal failure first then there is one surgery that is called as rovsing's surgery or rovsing's operation where we decap this cysts and relieve the pressure and try to maintain or salvage the kidney many new urologists now prefer laparoscopic approach to treat this particular condition overall prognosis is good now we'll move on to one most important aspect of urology that is hematuria when is hematuria or passage of blood in the urine is the most common complaint with which patient will come to you besides renal colic or renal pain so when patient comes to you with hematuria you have to be very well aware that we have to think of n number of possibilities related to this particular condition but before that it's very important for you to classify this particular entity now classification will vary depending on what factor we are studying now this classification can be based on the appearance into two main categories one is a gross hematuria that is macroscopic hematuria or occult or hidden or microscopic hematuria one that is detected on urine routine and microbiology second true hematuria versus false hematuria now this is one interesting concept true hematuria means patient will mention that he or she is passing red colored urine now whether this red colored urine is a true hematuria or false will be ascertained only on urine routine and microscopy examination third thing is depending on the nature that is the intermittent type or persistent type that also is very important next classification is initial hematuria that is at the beginning of the act of maturation or terminal hematuria that is at the end of the act of maturation or total or complete hematuria that is right from the start till the end of the act of maturation now why it is important suppose there is an initial hematuria it means that something that has come from up is getting first released so the pathology is at a higher level that is at the level of kidney if it is a terminal means it is coming from the last portion that is somewhere in the urethra or somewhere at the bladder neck or somewhere in the bladder and total means there is a possibility of involvement of urinary bladder plus ureters plus kidney and lastly most important practical classification is painless versus painful hematuria that is most important among all this classification that is anything that is a painless one needs to be extremely cautious while treating this patient because one has to consider malignancy painful usually occurs because of various benign conditions we'll see the causes one by one uh, co most common is the trauma which is often forgotten because it is causing to the back any trauma that is towards the back because the strong back muscles get hidden or sometimes the muscular pain will uh, just will be over expressed so patient will actually forget that there is something beneath the muscles that is the kidney that is also likely to get affected and it is a clinician who should be aware of this particular response that a fall on the back or something hit on the back is going to rise to a renal injury also 
second is cause the hematological causes such as purpura then the sickle cell trait and use of anticoagulants these three things can lead to hematuria third is the tumors or neoplasia wilms tumor that is a nephroblastoma in children renal cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma of the kidney and transitional cell carcinoma that is the carcinoma affecting the renal pelvis and collecting system will give rise to painless hematuria other common causes are infarction that is due to ischemia stones practically most common and these are the painful hematuria foreign body that is retained stents sometimes post procedural can occasionally give rise to hematuria infections infections can be due to severe pyelonephritis or tuberculosis which is common in our country in bladder there are various causes like tuberculosis cystitis tumors bilharzia or schistosomiasis stones and foreign body and miscellaneous that is joggers hematuria sometimes and because of the prostate that is a benign prostatic hyperplasia next we'll go to the second most common or rather the first most common cause of urinary uh, tract that is the urinary pain now various pain patterns one needs to understand depending on the organ that is getting involved if kidney that is a renal pain which will be a fixed pain located at renal angle and a deep seated pain second ureteric pain it will be a migratory pain going from loin to groin and it can be of acute nature or recurrent nature third is a bladder pain which can be suprapubic or present in the hypogastrium and usually re referred to the penile tip prostatic pain coming from the prostate which is usually at the perineum and rectum and it will be a continuous dull aching pain seminal vesical pain it can be similar like a prostatic pain but sometimes this pain can get radiated to the groin and lastly the urethral pain that is the typical burning type of pain or scalding type of pain during the voiding then we'll come to important topic that is the investigations pertinent to the kidney and urinary tract blood in blood what things would what things would study most important renal function tests that is the blood urea nitrogen and creatinine uh, now very important point is till 70% of the renal damage is done these tests are almost in a normal range that is what is actually disturbing so these tests when elevated shows more than 70% of the renal damage to the patient urine in urine one needs to understand urethrin microscopy culture sensitivity cytology to rule out malignancy and various biochemical parameters one needs to check such as electrolytes glucose presence to rule out diabetes presence of bilirubin presence of him or myoglobin urea due to muscle breakdown radiology forms important investigating modality for urinary tract there are various headings important most common is the ultrasound of the abdomen and pelvis will give a good picture of the entire system uh, for the lower tract we give because renal pelvis uh, the sonography will not work because of the bone will interfere with the ultrasonic waves that's why we use a transrectal ultrasound for have a better delineation of the urinary bladder as well as the lower urethra or the prostate so truss that is a transrectal ultrasound is very important in pelvic cavity second is the intravenous urography or urography again a gold standard but now ct scan has replaced it third is the rgu or retrograde pyelography or retrograde pyelo urethrography then ascending pyelography then we do a dsa study that is a digital subscription angiography study for detecting various small uh, vascular lesions pertinent to kidney such as hemangioma or angiomyelopoma then cystography uh, to check various bladder conditions ct scan of abdomen and pelvis now a gold standard because it will serve the function of ivu either way because one needs to inject iv contrast for this particular patient then the mri many urologists now advocate mri over ct scan because it's a soft tissue structure present in the retroperitoneum so they think mri gives a better delineation especially t2 wave images 
then isotope scanning this is very vital that is the uh, dtps scans or diethylene triamine pentacidic acid scans to save or salvage the kidney in special special situations which we will discuss eventually and lastly endoscopy that is the to uh, to see the lower urinary tract mainly we do endoscopy or transurethral scoping okay now we'll move on to the next important topic that is renal injury we again need to classify into two types direct versus indirect that is a direct transfer of energy against indirect transfer of energy and second classification is extraperitoneal versus intraperitoneal so intraperitoneal is actually rare this is mainly we are talking about the kidney not the other structures four patterns are seen one it can be a simple polar hematoma sometimes it can be partial polar tear sometimes polar avulsion and sometime vascular transaction surgical exploration is required only in 10% of the patient because urotus fascia forms a barrier towards expansion of blood so first two or three non expanding hematomas one can simply observe and take care of. then we move on to the very important topic of renal tuberculosis renal tb is hematogenous in origin from a distant focus pathologically various forms one can actually pick depending on what stage patient is coming to you it can be either a papillary ulcer a small ulcer present at the renal papilla small ulceration it can be a cavernous form sometimes it can be form a simple cavity or it can sometimes have hydronephrosis because affection of the puj it can have a pyonephrosis it can have a perinephric abscess collection below the urotus fascia pseudo calliculi opacifications kgs or putti kidney when there are multiple radiopaque shadows in the kidney one needs to be sure that it can be a putti kidney due to tuberculosis and miliary or mottled appearance affecting bilaterally both the kidneys now what should we do in renal tuberculosis investigate with urine uh what urine typical picture we get is a acid sterile pyuria a raised esr more than 100 triple figure esr which is characteristic for renal tb x ray chest may show primary focus which can be either old one or a fresh one usually a older one ultrasonography will show various pictures that we have already discussed intravenous urography or ct will be diagnostic modality which will actually support and confirm your diagnosis treatment treatment is usually medical unless there are complications such as non functioning kidney so in medical we give a four drug chemotherapy regime for at least one whole year surgery is only anticipated in complicated cases especially when pyonephrosis or non functioning kidney because we have to anticipate some complications for this usually tb has a good prognosis because of availability of very good chemotherapeutic agents and one rare uh, complication of renal tb when it's going to get affected from kidney to lower down is infertility so renal tb uh, so far what we have seen is various benign conditions in which we have studied the basic anatomy then what we have seen is the embryological aspect trauma two common symptoms that is a hematuria renal pain then a few congenital anomalies and what we have seen is renal tb and the other conditions such as the other conditions actually which are present uh, we will uh, see in our subsequent session thank you